sunsets, especially by the seashore. Leon doesn't miss a beat. Oh, I love the sea. And doesn't it seem to you, Emma continues, that the mind travels more freely on this limitless expanse of which the contemplation elevates the soul, gives ideas of the infinite, the ideal, and once again, Leo rises to the challenge. It is the same with mountainous landscapes, he says, and he talks about Switzerland. Such spectacles must stir to enthusiasm, inclined to prayer, to ecstasy. Flaubert, I think, is grimacing as he writes this language. For him, this is the trivialized, cliched language that people use when they speak about their needs and fantasies and desires. But what is characteristic of this book is that that conversation takes place in the inn that they are received in when they arrive in this new town, and it is cut, spliced almost cinematically by the remarks of the pharmacist in the town, and the pharmacist is the realist figure of this text. The pharmacist instead is going to talk about the ailments of the town to the doctor, so he gives us a kind of grocery list of enteritis and bronchitis and scrofula. He will talk about the median temperatures in each season. He describes the winds and the vapors and the exhalations and the fumes. He sounds like an almanac description of this village. And you've got to imagine the kind of contrapuntal technique of interweaving the sort of romantic cliches on the one hand and this sort of almanac information about the town and the other. That's the way Flaubert is going to work in this book. The love between Emma and Léon, because they are both in love with each other, is never consummated. Léon then leaves Yonville, and then comes the next candidate, Rodolphe, who is a handsome country gentleman and who is determined to seduce Emma, who is a pretty young woman. He says that she is gaping after love like a carp on the kitchen table after water. Emma, of course, is much taken with him. He's very seductive. He's very attractive. He has a kind of male authority and charm and charisma that Charles doesn't have at all. And so they go riding together. Charles abets this. He has no idea what's going on, and generally has no idea what's going on. And Rodolphe makes love to her. And there, too, I want you to hear the way this comes across. After they've had sex and she comes home, husband, of course, suspects nothing, all she can say is, I have a lover. I have a lover. She looks into the mirror. I have a lover. And she remembers all the heroines who have lovers in the, some of the books that she's read. But the way Flaubert, and that I want to suggest is that same cliched language, the way Flaubert has written the actual experience that she has when making love to him tells us about a different writer altogether. We see that the sun dazzles her eyes and she looks around and we hear about luminous patches that tremble on the ground as if hummingbirds flying about had scattered their feathers. And Flaubert writes, she felt her heartbeat return and the blood coursing through her flesh like a river of milk. That's not a cliche. That's the language of a poet. So that when Flaubert describes the actual sensations of this figure, language that she's not capable of herself, we get some sense that love, yes, is still something holy and beautiful. Later, more seasoned, Emma re-encounters Léon. She goes to Rouen, and she meets him at the opera. And now they're ready to have a more serious love affair because she's now a more practiced person. And this goes through all of the stages of passion, becoming more and more insistent and provocative and desperate she sees him, as I said, at the opera. She sees at the opera the kind of magnification of human passion. And so she starts to, with Charles's blessing, he has no idea what's going on, says that she needs to go to Rouen for music lessons. She goes and has these romantic trysts with Léon. And she becomes more and more demanding with him, that she insists more and more that he satisfy her wants. She becomes much, as it were, the man of the relationship. Flaubert can write very powerfully about that. One, one paragraph, she undressed brutally, ripping off the thin laces of her corset so violently that they would whistle around her hips like a gliding snake. 
She would let her clothes fall at once to the ground, then pale and serious without a word, she would throw herself against his breast with a long shudder. I mean, it almost has a sickly dimension, a kind of desperate pathological dimension to it. And soon enough, this also runs its course, and she realizes, I quote, every smile concealed a yawn of boredom, every joy a curse, every pleasure it's on disgust, and the Swedish kisses left upon your lips only the unattainable desire for a greater delight. This then would be the punishment that's meted out to passion and desire. The worst thing that you can do to desire is to satisfy it, because it can't be satisfied. There's almost a systolic diastolic in what I just read to you. Smile conceals a yawn of boredom. Joy hides a curse. Pleasure brings its own disgust. This is almost mechanical. To use a French term, it's the machine infernal, the infernal machine of passion itself. There is no ultimate satisfaction in this. Emma Bovary's desire for gratification cannot be ultimately fulfilled. The book closes with her suicide via poison. She's been on a treadmill that the great quest for romance and fulfillment is doomed. And yet the book is great because it gives us so many perspectives on this. One perspective that it doesn't give us, but that I want to give us, is to see this in the context of other 19th century novels that are also about the tragic quest for love on the part of women. I'm thinking of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, which is very parallel to Madame Bovary, although it is not surgical. It's not cold in the same way. But it's, a, I think, a very rich story about a woman's desire, not that she seeks as Emma does, but she runs into is shocked by a romance and cannot say no to it and steps across the line and will be destroyed by it. Or Ibsen's play Hedda Gobbler, which is a really almost neurotic case study of a woman who is suffering the boredom of marriage with a man who, of course, is even more boring than you could imagine, much more so than Charles Bovary. But think of a novel like Kate Chopin's The Awakening. The 19th century is filled with books where women have no other course, it seems. They have no professional possibilities. They have no social avenues. And so love would seem to be the only route, the doomed route, according to Flaubert, for some form of self-enactment, some form of gratification. Emma Bovary is in a text that is sacrificial. It reveals the dead end of the cult of feeling. In fact, when Emma is pregnant, she hopes that her child will be a boy, so that he will have power. She has a girl. And yet, it's worth remembering, she commits suicide ultimately, not just because of love problems, but because of money problems. And I haven't talked about that intentionally. She is in hock to the village's shopkeeper, Monsieur Lheureux, who constantly plies her with clothings and, and clothing and furnishings that come from Paris to sort of stoke her fantasies, her desires, she gets further and further into debt. She becomes further, more and more ingenious in finding ways to use her husband's money to pay some of these bills, some, because the bills continue to mount higher and higher, and finally, Lure calls the debt, and she's desperate. Where is she going to get this money? And she goes, she tries to borrow it from, her, from Rodolphe, who doesn't give it to her. He claims that he doesn't have it. This is the part of the novel where we begin to realize that it's not just the books that you read that may give you ideas of romance, but it's also the clothes that you buy, the fashion magazines that you know about, the fantasies that you have about what constitutes the seductive, elegant life of style. All of that is what desire is also about. In other words, the marketplace is in this book. This is why this is a modern book as well. The marketplace helps to create our appetites. Well, the novel doesn't close only with her death. It closes with this weird, rather distasteful sort of duel, conversational duel, between the major antagonist, Ome, the pharmacist, uh, and the curé, the priest. And it's where Flaubert stages a kind of dialogue or debate between religion on the one hand and science on the other. And Flaubert is equally disgusted with both because he thinks both are utterly cliched, 
both have a kind of monomaniacal picture 